Well, how wonderful that Jesus would call his disciples, that's you and me, his friends. The Christian tradition rightly celebrates this. What a friend we have in Jesus, proclaims the hymn writer. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. If the hymn turns into an entreaty on prayer, this is because friendship with the eternal word made flesh must surely revolve around prayer. For it is in prayer that we explore and build a relationship with the divine. I wonder how important friendship with Jesus and with fellow disciples is to us, to you and me. Friendship with Jesus and with each other. Important to Jesus, but how important to you and to me in our thinking and understanding. Do we get what a wonderful privilege it is to be a friend of Jesus, a friend of God like Moses and friends of each other? It seems to me that we live in a world that celebrates friendship on the one hand, but sometimes devalues it on the other. Facebook names all our contacts as friends. Many people have many hundreds of Facebook friends, but are they actual friends? Certainly some of us greatly value our friendships. Indeed, for some, the world seems to revolve around their friendships. I know of people who moved to a new house and new neighbourhood just to be near their friends. You might know some, you might have done it yourself. People move for family or for jobs, but not so often for friends. But I know of people who've done just that. I know many more who stayed where they were entirely because of their friends. They stayed in a neighbourhood or a house or a place that they didn't prefer and they could have gone elsewhere, but they stayed where they were, where they were because they valued their friendships and didn't want to give them up. Still, I read just the other day of a woman in middle age, at least that's what she called it, who had 633 Facebook friends, but suddenly woke up to the realization that she was isolated and lonely with few real friends in the world. Social media may turn out to be something less than truly social after all. With or without Facebook, and even before the COVID pandemic, we were being told that loneliness has reached epidemic proportions in our society. That's one of the reasons why we started our initiative, Friday Friends. And it's why we and so many others miss it so much. You are my friends, says Jesus. You are my friends. Just stop and savour those words. You are my friends. He goes on, however, and it gets a bit unusual. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Isn't there something a little strange about that? Well, it suggests at least two things to me. First, Jesus' status as Lord and Master is not denuded by his calling his disciples his friends. Friendship with Jesus is not supposed to mean that Jesus is your best buddy, your pal, your chum or your best mate. Such is an over-sentimentalised version of friendship with Jesus. 
Despite popular notions to the contrary, it's not Jesus's job as our friend to ignore all our sins and failings, to put up with us and to agree with us, even when our behaviour entirely contradicts the Christian gospel. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. Or perhaps we should say slaves. I no longer call you servants or slaves. But this does not mean that we should no longer serve the Lord. I no longer call you servants. I no longer call you slaves. But that doesn't mean that as disciples, we shouldn't now still serve the Lord as we're commanded to do. I no longer call you servants or slaves, says Jesus, because the servant or the slave does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. The Trinitarian God is thus the model and agent of friendship. But thankfully, God is still God and Jesus is still Lord. Jesus calls his disciples his friends, but they are still disciples. Indeed, they are friends because they are disciples. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Second, the command Jesus gives is itself an extension of the friendship that he initiates. This is my commandment, he says, that you love one another as I have loved you. You are my friends, Jesus seems to say, if you love one another. And love in John's gospel is not really a feeling. In our society, love's all about feelings. And it's not that it's devoid of feelings in John, but it's not primarily a feeling. You cannot command a feeling. You just can't, however hard you try. But Jesus commands love. Love for John, for Jesus in John, is action. It is living for the good of the other. Love one another. Put the interests of the other above your own. And you've become a true friend to that other. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Our culture celebrates such an ideal. Our news outlets have been full of it recently. When 20-year-old Jimmy Adewale instinctively jumped into the River Thames, to try to rescue a woman who had fallen in and lost his own life in the process. Everyone rightly hailed him as a hero and a true friend to a person he had never met and did not know. Jimmy Adewale reminds us of people all over the world who put their own lives at risk for the sake of others. We saw it with hospital staff at the height of the pandemic in this country and are seeing it now globally all over the world. We see it in those who give their lives for a great cause, like Martin Luther King for the civil rights movement, or Homero Gomez Gonzalez, might not be known to all of you. In fact, I only learned about him this week. But Homero Gomez Gonzalez was murdered in 2020 because he was, get this, a butterfly advocate. 
a butterfly advocate. More precisely, he was an advocate for the monarch butterflies that make El Rosario Reserve in Mexico their winter home. Some of you might have seen this on the internet, and if you haven't, you should. Just Google it. Monarch butterfly in Mexico, it'll get you there. Millions of butterflies make El Rosario Reserve in Mexico their winter home. Millions of butterflies migrate there from as far away as Canada. The concentration of monarch butterflies there has been called a superlative natural phenomenon. And apparently it's beautiful and amazing to see. Well, as the manager of the El Rosario Reserve, Gomez opposed illegal logging and advocated for the replanting of trees that are the monarch's habitat. And he was murdered for his efforts. You could say Gomez laid down his life for the butterflies, but not only for the butterflies, for a world that can sustain life and that God made good in all its diversity. Of course, the greatest example of a life laid down is that of Jesus himself. He is saying to his disciples in John 15, I'm going to lay down my life for you, my friends. Yet the laying down of one's life does not have to mean literally that you die for someone. Jimmy Adewale had a friend who jumped into the River Thames with him. Unlike Jimmy, his friend Bernard survived. His efforts were also heroic. And though he lived to tell the tale, he too offered his life on behalf of another. Now, having read this week's New Testament passages, and especially John 15, not quite sure why, but I found myself thinking about the analogy of the long spoons. I think many of you will know it. You've probably heard a version of it before. A man dreamt he was on a, he was on a tour of hell, taken perhaps by God or an angel to see hell and what it was like there. And there he was surprised to find that the inhabitants were all sat at long tables, each overflowing with a magnificent feast. Yet the diners were emaciated and sickly, moaning with hunger. They all had very long spoons. And their arms were tied to splints of wood that kept their arms extended. In this position, they were unable to bend the spoons to their mouths. Hell was filled with hungry, tortured people. Tortured by the fact that they were so close to the most amazing food imaginable. And yet could not eat it. Then the man in the story visited heaven and found a similar scene. Long tables, hungry souls, strapped arms, unable to bend their hands to their mouths to eat. But there was a profound difference. The diners in heaven sat across from each other, not trying to feed themselves, but trying to feed the person across from them. The difference between heaven and hell was simply that the inhabitants of hell were concerned only for themselves, while heaven was populated with people who spent their time serving each other. That image of heaven is also a picture of friendship. Thankfully, 
friendship will not always require that we die for our friends. Although sometimes it might. But it will certainly require our laying down our lives in daily service for each other. Such service must be freely given if it's to qualify as friendship. But such service, such friendship, is life-giving, transformative and liberating. This is the friendship Jesus offers his disciples and bids them to share with each other and the wider world. What glorious good news. God invites us into divine friendship through Jesus Christ. God befriends us and sends us to be friends of others. Such friendship will cost, but it can also make life worth living as well as dying for. <laughs>